You're listening to Investify, preaching financial independence and assisting investors to achieve a more flexible and free lifestyle through smart financial planning and real estate investing. If leaving the corporate world and jumping into this thriving industry is what you desire, tune in and listen to stories of like-minded individuals who made the leap to financial independence. Equip yourself with the right tips and tricks to start your real estate journey, making active or passive ventures that are highly profitable and rewarding. Here are your hosts, Craig Kerlop and Ziana McIntyre. What's going on, everyone? You are listening to Investify. My name is Craig Kerlop, aka The Fi Guy, and I'm here with my co host, Ziana McIntyre, aka Z Money. How are you doing today, Z? I am doing great. I love Z Money. It's so fun. People always laugh at me about it, but I think it's a cute name. It is sticking, I, Craig. Congratulations. It is sticking. I did it. I'm just waiting for you to change your Instagram handle to Z Money. If oh you God. think Ziana should change her Instagram <laughs> handle to Z Money, make sure you flood her inbox with DMs, Ziana McIntyre, <laughs> and tell her to change it to Z Money. Yeah. Okay. And we'll I just like keep that. annoying her. Like yeah. Okay, well, okay. Let's see how many people come through. Nice. Well, yeah. today we have Marcus Garrett from the Marcus Garrett podcast. And I feel like he has inspired me. I'm like, Craig, how do we make our voices silky smooth? Okay, definitely gonna do it. The yeah. Marcus Garrett show. I don't know. I love it. I yep. was just like really excited uh, that he's yeah. so good at that. <laughs> He's got an amazing voice. Before we bring him on, though, I want to say that last week, Z, you asked me or told me that I should read The Gap and the Gain, and I did it. I read it, and now I feel like I am on the same page as everybody else in the world, and it was great. So I just want nice. you to know that I'm holding myself accountable to the things that you tell me to do. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'm ready to hear your 25-year vision, so work on that and come back to us, Craig. <laughs> oh, damn it. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> calling me out. I am calling you out. That's what I'm here for. Yeah. Uh, all right. All right. 25 well, years, I'll get this to you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's bring on the Marcus Garrett. The Marcus Garrett. Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Dude, you have like the radio voice. We got to publish this one late night. Oh my gosh. I'm going to listen to you talk all day. Um, I appreciate it. I mean, I'm actually trying to get into that space, so uh, please reach out. (laughs) Okay, there you go. If you need a radio voice, the Marcus Garrett. Um, All right, Marcus, tell us. Where did you first learn about financial independence? I'm going to go with FinCon 2016 San Diego conference. I mean, I might have loosely known about financial independence before that, but I know that was a game changer where I, I found my tribe, my nerds, if you will, my money nerds is a self-proclaimed title. Um, and it really opened my eyes to a wealth of knowledge and literal wealth outside of the traditional nine to five. And I have not been able to uh, pack back that inception ever since I've, I've been uh, captured there. Yeah. FinCon is such a powerful, powerful conference. It was, it's one of my favorites as well, but what got you to go to FinCon if you weren't, uh, you know, if you weren't an influencer, you weren't a producer, you didn't have any content. By that time, we actually did have a podcast. Uh, I've moved on to a separate brand since this time. And he had gone to Podcast Movement, I believe. And I believe that was his first, at least, podcast conference. And they were like, you got to go to FinCon. You got to go to FinCon. You got to do blah, 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 blah. And uh, I don't, not sure if we had transitioned to personal finance yet at that time, but I was like, I, I'm not going to San Diego. What the hell is FinCon? I'm not spending the money. It's not in the budget. I had gotten out of debt recently, is what I had ultimately been talking about. And I was like, no. No, I'm not doing it. And I ended up doing it. And I was walking through the hallway and I saw the uh, founder of the conference and I, I stopped him. I was like, you have something amazing here. And just because I'm an auditor and I've been to conferences and I, I know how boring they are. They're falling asleep in the back of it. And I was like running around like a kid in a candy store. So I, I knew I had really found something special. That's awesome. Yeah. I wanted to talk about this idea of being cheap versus frugal because that happens to all of us. We've all said, oh, I don't want to spend the 
the money on this thing because we're trying to be frugal and trying to get to our goals. But actually something like FinCon is really an investment. And you can go as someone who is not a creator, who um, is part of the community pass. They have like a cheaper pass to go and just learn and network and everything. And so I just kind of wanted to put that out there for people if they're feeling excited and they want to meet their tribe because it really is a tribe out there. Yeah, yeah they're all... Um... They're in Dallas this year or no. Um, so they're definitely in Texas and I actually won't be able to make it this year or get married. <laughs> so uh, oh. the time they're in my state, I'll be, I'll miss it. Um, so I have another financial obligation. Yeah. I would say getting married is more important than FinCon. Um, <laughs> just throwing it out there. Maybe, 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 but FinCon is probably the second most important thing that would happen in your life. So, uh, it's awesome that you got to go and it's awesome. So was there, is there, you know, it sounds like you met, met the founder of FinCon. You met some, some, a couple other influential people. What did you get out of FinCon that then you went and applied towards your journey on financial independence? I've been six other times and I, I'm going to work backwards for that purpose. So the first time I got like, uh, we had a Trello board. I still use Trello to this day. And I, I must have had 150 task in there just so i got a wealth of information the owner was right is the the investment in myself it's probably a, a few thousand to get out there for so it was last minute and, and you know it's san diego so everything's expensive but beyond worth it i've gone every year since uh, except for the, the year and i actually think it was canceled for the pandemic and i went this year which was in austin um so i guess the takeaway is my mind literally shifted. That's why I used the uh, in Inception reference, which I now realize is like a 10 to 15 year old movie. I'm becoming that guy where I can only make mo references to old <laughs> movies. But <laughs> that being said, I think it's popular enough that people have still seen the movie. And it's just, I, I, even to this day, a seed was planted that I could not get rid of. And so it, mm -hmm. it put a fork in my road that I continue to follow today. It started learning about the true financial independence, retire early, uh, the movement behind it, all the individuals started interviewing these people and the network that came out of that. I'm still friends and, and, and interacting with these people. These people are still lifting me up to this day. Awesome. And so what is your, so, okay. So you find out this investment strategy, you find out about financial independence, retire early. You find that there's like a whole bunch of other people that are kind of doing this too. What is your strategy towards financial independence? Is, is it a real estate? Are you a stocks guy? Like what's, yeah. What, what is your method? Not real estate. And um, it shifted for me. And I, I think that's what happens with growth. So, you know, one, the pandemic, one with age. And so I started out with, you know, first learning the movement. And I, the reason I phrase it that way is, you know, we, we all know about savings. And, and uh, I had been investing. I'd been investing since at least age 27, technically 22, if you count investments through my employer. But I started independently investing at age 27. And like, I just know the basics of it. But that was kind of like eye opening that there was more beyond just one plus one, two plus two, put in the savings account, a high yield savings account that makes 0.009%. Um, so it. it I just didn't even know that that was an option that I could exercise. I think the way that it's evolved over the years, I've now launched my own brand. I've lost launched my own business. I'm about a year in. Actually, I'm past a year into my own business. I know because I owe a fee <laughs> and I'm about to file taxes. And so now I am starting to look into real estate. And I think um, it might seem basic to some individuals that this has been their lived experience, but I didn't have anyone to go to. Um, my parents don't invest in real estate. My parents aren't entrepreneurs. Uh, they still retired early and have done well from themselves and provided for me and my sister. But these weren't conversations we had. And I didn't have mentors and natural conversations to talk to people about financial independence and what to do beyond investing and what to do beyond the savings account. That was really it. It was go to go to work, get a pension because we worked in the public sector and and then do that for 40 years. Like what the hell are y'all talking about? <laughs> and so um, it, it was a network. It was an opportunity and, and I exercised it. I think that's important too. Great. So for the people that are listening, what are some concrete steps? Cause I think I know your story a little bit cause I've been on your show. Um, and I think you did a big debt pay down experience. So there is this kind of experience of getting to zero, but then once you're at zero and you can start saving, what were some concrete things that people could maybe try? So for me, yeah. So my background in the book that I have is like a bestseller. I actually be free in April. I'm not sure when this podcast is dropped. So hopefully they can still get access to it. Um, 
I paid off $30,000 in debt, but more importantly, I got $30,000 in debt, $26,000 of which was in one weekend. And so, <laughs> and so graduated Ooh. school, bought a car, bought rims, spent a lot of money, blah, 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 $30,000 in debt. Paid that off at age 30. And then what I was talking about, I didn't know what it was at the time, which is funny. Um, at 27, I was at work. Um, I had a bunch of investments accounts like that had rolled over from three or four jobs that I had taken. And I remember uh, I got an email and they said that TIA CREF, actually, I'm not paid by them, but I'll go ahead and name drop. They're like, we'll be on site and it's free financial advice. We'll consolidate all your, um, it would have been 403s, I believe for me, because I'm in public sector for you. I thought the line would be around the corner. Like I was so excited reading this email because I'm a nerd. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, I, I'm going to get there like as soon as it opens. And I remember I walked up and I think I woke the guys up. Like <laughs> I didn't know what they were setting up for me at the time, but they did transfer all the accounts and it was an index fund to answer the question. And I still use index funds to this day, uh, which are <laughs> low cost investment vehicles. But because, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know is like, well, I'll just sit back and let that grow. Uh, and it did. It grew to a, actually it grew really well. It was uh, about 30,000 before I transferred it again. And I was like, but it seems so slow. I still have to wait uh, because I wasn't practicing uh, fat fire at that time. So I still have to wait 20, 30 years. It's like, I, is there a way to do this faster? Which is why, you know, you know, I like this idea of real estate and cash flow fire now. So it's being open to new ideas evolving and actualizing them so i plan to move into real estate upon this marriage and i've already talked to the missus about it like i want to get into real estate to bring in more uh, multiple income streams awesome man so i think i think that's kind of a funny evolution that you had right where you kind of go from this person who doesn't know much about money he's in a bad financial position with thirty thousand dollars of debt because of a car which is a depreciating asset so we never recommend buying a car but many times you don't buy, if you don't know what you're doing with your money, you shouldn't buy a car with a loan. Um, and then you go ahead and invest in the stock market because that seems like what everyone does. An index fund is low risk. And again, you're there to 10, 15 years, but you're looking around at your folks and you're like, well, all these people are already retired. How can I do it quicker? Right. And so you've, you've now gone into this journey of real estate uh, and you, so you're not quite there yet. It sounds you're still going to be purchased. You're still, that's to come. Yeah, I'm actually reading. Uh, Ziona actually might be able to help me out. It's Bigger Pockets. Uh, so I, I try to read like a book a month, typically personal finance, and I do a review. So I read 20, which again, just that evolution of thought. I did a review of each, and that's uh, available on my website at themarcusgarrett.com. I give it away for free now. Uh, so I, I kind of look at it as three pathways, and it, it can multiply from him here. Uh, so, like you said, the first pathway, maybe four, was get out of debt and get that behind me, get high interest debt behind me, which was, for me was credit cards predominantly. Uh, the second pathway is like the long game. So I have a pension. I actually have three uh, because I've been working in the public sector. But the golden cuffs of the public sector is that for the trade off of a pension, you work here for pretty much all your life, 40, 50, 60 years. And then at 67, you get this pension and allegedly you can spend it. But you got three to eight years left in your life. And I was like, so pathway number two is. The index fund, I started investing in that separately and independently. So I've taken my own money and I'm using that to invest in the index fund. But pathway number three is I want to move this finish line. So I've got 67, perhaps through the index fund, maybe it's in my 50s. Um, I want to get there quicker because as I've gotten older, the irony is the time became more important to me and I want it back. And also my mindset has kind of shifted what I, I want and prioritize um, from life, from a career. And it's like, I don't want to trade my time for money. That is money is obviously not left lost its importance to me, but it's not the driver that it used to be. Like I would quit jobs. I've moved all over the country chasing after it. Um, I have other priorities. And one of those is getting my time back, buying back my time, ironically. I'm curious if you own your home or kind of what your thoughts are around that, just like where you actually um, live. No, I, I haven't owned a home and we'll be getting into the the home market. And that's what we'll have to navigate as far as real estate goes is, is what does that look like as far as my personal ownership and and then, you know, this real estate things that I want to get into as far as uh, I think I want to do a buy and hold as I'm understanding it right now, buy probably single family homes and just get an understanding of it, get comfortable with it and move on from there. Um same thing so, with my. Go ahead. There, there's this really good book out there called uh, The House Hacking Strategy. I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, maybe you could buy your house with a low percent down, and maybe rent out the you know rent out the basement or something. 
Hey, are you plugging your book? I'm no, I don't know what you're talking about. No, I, I, <laughs> I, I just say sure it was like, it yeah. sound, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. It sounds yeah. like a great read, by the way. I, I, it should have been my response. <laughs> yeah. No. Have you uh, have you heard heard of that though? Have you uh, or have you uh, thought I've about heard, that or talked about that with your wife? I, I've heard of house hacking, and uh, I've actually never owned a home. I've always rented, and I did not realize the. I won't call it a privilege, but in some ways, it is maybe privilege with an asterisk because I, I grew up in Texas, so it's you know you could get uh, you can get a you can get a mansion out here for like you know. 300,000, if not 500,000 for sure. So the I didn't realize the importance and the advantage that I had with such a low cost of living. Um, and actually, until I moved to Denver, rent was really never an issue. It's really not an issue now. On the other side of it, you know, I can, it sounds like complaining about work, but really my perception of it has just changed. I've, so I, there's another story out there uh, where I increased my income 400 percent because I'm always negotiating my salary and also chasing money. So I had been successful in my pursuit, so I didn't really have to worry over time about the difference between cost of living and these other avenues, which is a, a fortunate monetary experience. But as my mentor told me, eventually I got to a point where it's transactional. So I'm trading money because I thought that would buy happiness. But when I got there and got to the mountaintop, I realized it didn't and it wouldn't. Um, and so I need to look at, I need to take some personal ownership. I talked to Ziona about this, take personal ownership. Like you got what you wanted, you got a bunch of money. It just wasn't the pot of gold of happiness that you thought it would be. So taking a step back and, OK, how does that change and what do I need to do, whether it is through real estate? And before that, I was doing I still am doing multiple income streams, because what's more important to me is that I I have a comfortable margin. And the way I'm describing it now is I want it right now. I don't really have to. I think I'm calling. It, I don't really have to think about money. I go back and forth between think and worry and that we can do whatever we want. Don't really have to think about it. But I want to get to a point where I don't have to worry about money. Like right now, mm -hmm. if I want to take a vacation, I still need permission to take PTO. I still need my boss's permission to work from home. I still need permission to basically be functionally an independent adult, which is really just the career of, that suffers from many millennials of why we have the great resignation. So now I want to get to a point where that is not a concern through whatever these revenue streams look like. And it's looking like it's going to be the multiple income streams plus real estate. Awesome. And Marcus, what is it that you do right now? That's uh, as I'm, an I'm an You're auditor. You're an auditor? Okay. W2 okay. auditor, so to speak. Okay. Okay. And so that takes up most of your time. And how much of your income are you saving from that job right now? It varies, but right now, not a lot for the wedding, <laughs> but it's high. I, uh, I've been up to 50%. Um, and then I was putting aside like 18%. Uh, and then I have to put aside 9%. They pull that out automatically. Okay. And so given that trajectory, when are you looking to potentially quit your job? As soon as possible. Hell yeah. Do you have like a target though? I don't have a target threshold uh, right now because I'm not really, I wouldn't say I'm a traditional fire. Like I'm not looking to retire early i'm looking to replace the income in a way that would make me happier with what i'm doing like with the 40 to 50 to 60 hours of my life 100 percent. yeah no for sure man i think like working for yourself and even if you're if you're working 40 hours a week at a job you hate and you're working 60 hours a week at something you love like it's the 60 hours a week is still better all day but you talk a little bit about and i want to dig in a little more about um you know you got all this money now and you realize that money is now what makes you happy and time people always say this, but time is kind of like, like, what is time? Like, what is time? Right? Like time, you're not just going to sit in your room all day because that's time. Right? So what do you do with your time that makes you happy? And why do you want that back? Actually, uh, I'm a push on that a little bit. I would sit in my room because there are days where that makes me happy. And that's not an option right now. So uh, I'll answer it this way, because uh, I was going through this five step journey. I'm actually about to do an office hour for my community newsletter. And it's define your dream, define five goals, define, break those goals into steps and then put step one into action. You know, that's how you create action and build a system. And I to in reverse engineer that I think about my happiest days. And for me, Marcus Garrett, it is I wake up to no alarm. I just wake up naturally to birds, coffee cat, whatever. And then I either have that day mapped out or I know what I need to do as far as my action items. And to your point, that might be a 60 hour week because there are some insane weeks. Uh, like I actually think when I was recording with Ziona, <laughs> I probably worked some insane amount of weeks to get all the video and editing and everything done. But like you said, I'm happy doing it. So it doesn't feel like work. Also, I'm coincidentally making money from it. So great. 
And what I really have come to realize is um, my happiness is both time, freedom and control of my day and my actions. Those are my happiest days. If I set my calendar and I decide to wake up at 630, that's fine. My boss calls me at 631. I'm not in a good mood. <laughs> so yeah. so that, that, that I'm trying to design a lifestyle financially or otherwise that allow me to achieve those things. Hey everyone, big news. Investify has now partnered with Rent Ready. And yes, we've partnered with Rent Ready because that is the software system that both me and Ziana use to do property management for our rental properties. It makes things super easy. We can send applications, get background checks and credit checks. They uh, Tenants, when they come in, can pay rent automatically through there. They can submit maintenance requests, do everything you need to do for property management all in one place. That's why Rent Ready is the thing that we've done. I've been using them for years now. And that's why they're, you know, we, we reached out to them for a relationship on the show. And so again, super excited to have them on board. If you go to rentready.com and use the code investify, you'll get 50% off your first six months. That's right. 50% off your first six months. If you go to uh, rentready.com, sign up and use the coupon code invest to FI. Uh, and I can't wait to see you there. Let us know, you know, hit us up on Instagram, hit us up on wherever, and let us know what you think of, of rent ready. Uh, Cause again, I think it's an amazing software. I use it all the time. You can access it from your phone. Amazing stuff. So thanks so much. And let's get back to the episode. I wanted to talk about any like strategies that really worked for you. First off, when you were paying down your debt, were there specific things that you did that, would be actionable for people to try it out? Yeah. So I, uh, the book goes through and it's a free plan at the marcusgarrett.com slash debt free, but I'll walk through it quickly. It's four step plan. Debt is an acronym. So it's D define the problem. E establish a plan. B build a budget and T trust the process. So I am an auditor and I do like systems. So for me, defining the problem is I went to annual credit report, establishing a plan. Uh, I'm old school. So I went to bankrate.com slash calculators. They're still around. They still exist. <laughs> I think they're actually number one. Uh, Nerd wallet might be up there now. And then I purposely though, coincidentally, because B is third step in the process, build a budget, which kind of goes back to Craig's answer is now can you support a lifestyle that allows you to do those things? So maybe your plan is I want to be debt free in 24 months, but that means no more mimosas or avocado toast or coffee. Is that a life that you want to live? Are those the sacrifices you want to make? Uh, whereas before I was in Denver, I cut everything. I, and I detail this in the book, gave up vacation, started. I was that guy. I was literally cutting my own hair. <laughs> like I went bald for two years, saved forty eight hundred dollars because of how expensive my, my barber was, um, you know, cut cable, did all those things. And then but I look back now, especially post in a post pandemic world. And I look at all the memories I missed out on, like I was passing up on weddings. Uh, I think you know, now they're teenagers, but the children were being born. I'm like, no, nah, guys, I'm getting out of debt. And I was like, I talk when I talk to younger people at that time, I was 27. When I talked to 20 year olds, I'm like, you know, think twice about this. Because when you're 37 or 47, you're actually going to think more about those memories than the fact that you saved $200 on cable that month. So just just really find a balance there. Uh, but those are the four strategies that work for me to pay off debt. I love that. And I'm curious. I want to like talk about this a little bit more. Craig, do you feel like when you were scrimping and saving hardcore, because I know you are not as much now, um, what do you feel like you missed some stuff? It's funny. Um, I, I actually, so I moved to Denver from San Francisco and San Francisco, I was living the dream, right? Like I was buying a hundred dollar shirts and wearing $150 shoes. And I had the watch, all the, all that stuff. Like it was not who you know me as today, but I decided to like reestablish my identity when I moved to Denver and I, I knew nobody in Denver. And so I feel like because I knew nobody, I wasn't missing out on anything. And so for about a year and a half, I was like, just like you, Marcus, like I would sit at home and on the weekends, I'd be reading and writing. I'd be riding my bike to the grocery store and I would have a backpack full of groceries and it was like five miles to the grocery store. Um, I would hang dry all my clothes. I put, I squeezed soap into a little little bowl and put the sponge in the bowl. You, you can do all the stupid tricks, I'm sure. The water bottle in the toilet thing. Like all these things I would do to just save like literally probably like $1.50. Um, <laughs> and uh, to say it worked, who knows? Um, but 
again, I think I think just like the the mindset of like being scrappy, kind of like paying your dues, right? If you're like an investment banker in the finance space, you're going to work your ass off for like 100 hours a week for the first couple of years and you're going to make 115 grand a year. Well, like you and me and Ziana, I'm sure you went through this phase too. Like we paid our dues for a couple of years and now we're reaping the benefits. So that's my two cents. Yeah, I, I like that. And I think for me, it's interesting, but some of my richest times were when I was being really frugal. And the reason for it is because I had so much free time that I made a ton of friends that lived really close or they had really flexible schedules. And I had just so much time with them. We were cooking mm-hmm. meals at each other's houses. We were just riding bikes, going to the park, doing things that were free, but um, just brought a lot of richness into my life. So there are times when I think, damn, I've never seen Beyonce in concert, but you know what? <laughs> I will <laughs> one day, damn it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think there's yeah. there's something special about like doing more with less too. Like how fun is it like riding in a freaking canoe, right? Passing a yacht or something crazy. Or like, you know, we're in my, I'm in like a crappy little car in the mountains and we're able to like have a picnic on top of my car, right? Like, I don't know. There's like memories like that that I've had that I think like having less is almost been the fun of it um as long as you've got the right people around you so yeah i yeah. will uh, i'll clarify two points uh number one since you both i actually i think you're in boulder too the owner you were at one point uh denver is the yeah. perfect city to to scrimp save and be miserable in because it's a beautiful city <laughs> and there's so yeah. much outdoor so many free activities texas yeah. eh, i don't know so much about so i will say that the fact that i coincidentally i went for money i went for a job i got a 40 percent increase so i i went chasing after money and land it in a beautiful city. Uh, like you said, coming from San Diego or landing in San Diego, that might be a different lived experience. Uh, I want to recognize that, that I, I if it wasn't for like family and friends, I, I would, wouldn't have come back to Texas. Uh, Denver was, was a great city. So maybe if you're like in doubt, go to Denver and, and solve all your worries, mile high city. But the other uh, piece of it, I now realize 10 years of maturity was uh, there was a mental health component that I gravely underestimated. I remember I was two or three years in and and, uh, I didn't properly diagnose it. I didn't go into therapy until I was in my thirties and I was just sad. I was just sad all the time. And I I was like, Oh, well maybe I probably, so I I was like, Oh, I need to drink and participate in other things that are legal in Denver. That, that didn't cure it. And then I finally realized years later I was homesick. (laughs) I miss my friends like you. I moved there with nobody. But because I'm an introvert, this is the part that reflects on me. I didn't go anywhere. I just stayed to myself. I went to work. I went to home. I went to work. I went to home. And so for the first two or three years, I was there for seven. This sadness overwhelmed me and I didn't know what it was. And I missed my family. I missed my friends, uh, which is Mm -hmm. part of the reason I came home. So Also, probably if I had diagnosed that more correctly, which is why I'm an advocate for mental health now and why I go to therapy is that might have it might have made the the lived experience different. Unfortunately, much later and maybe even too late in the process, I was like, I'm going to force myself to go out and really embrace what Denver is. So I did really experience Denver to the latter end. Yeah, I've got a question about you in the in the depression state that you were in. Did you know at the time that you were depressed or did you like cuz I feel like I've been in a state before where I was down. I didn't even know I was down until I realized like how happy like I am now looking back on it and been like, damn, I think I was depressed back then. Like, did you have the same experience or, or did, were you just like down and out? No, almost the exact same because, you know, I wasn't I wasn't taking the appropriate steps or tools and I wasn't working with a professional. So I was just self-diagnosing. I'm like, oh, yeah. And I was being maybe some toxic masculinity. I'm like, oh, you're being a punk. Get over it. Shrug your shoulders, rub some dirt in it. You'll be fine. (laughs) Uh, That obviously did not work. And I, like you said, I think it was either an external feeling or someone diagnosed it might've been a professional for me. They're like, did you ever think that maybe you're homesick? (laughs) That maybe, maybe you feel sad because you're sad. So diagnose what you're not doing that made you happy. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not really sure when I broke out of it. Obviously, I can see it very clearly now in hindsight. But I, I remember there was some kind of distinct moment. I was like, oh, yeah, I don't. All I do is go to work and come home. Like, maybe I do need to have a life outside of this. Yeah, what I what I realized from that was that if I every single when I was living in California is when I think I, I didn't realize I was depressed. But that's when I was depressed was that 
every single day I would be just looking forward to Thursday, Friday, Saturday where I could go out and drink. And like, if you're only looking forward to the weekend to drink, you're probably depressed in some sort of way. But if you're excited for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and every day of your life is exciting because it's different, then I think that, that that's where I feel the most happy. Maybe other people are different, but I, I'll say one because I think it's a quick thing to that. And I also felt guilty for feeling sad. And maybe that is depression too. Uh, this is where I would need a professional help because uh, it's like, well, you've got a raise and you're making great money and you live in a great city. So you start, you know, what ifing and shooting yourself. And so it's like you you have no reason to feel bad. You have no reason to feel sad. And I wasn't talking to anybody about it. And so I, you know, I just got in this vicious cycle. Yeah, yeah, that's easy to do. Um, I have a question about where you learned all the five tips that you have now. Was it reading blogs? Was there a particular book that really helped you? Because you're still on your journey. You're very close. But um, what? Yeah, what are your the people you look up to and stuff? So the book challenge. It's. I'm going to say it was the podcast actually, but it was not with purpose or strategy. I there A guest came on, I wish I, I could remember her name, and she said, if you read 10 pages a day, she did math, which is always amazing. She's like, if you read 10 pages a day, you can read the average 300 books. So you can read 300, book, uh, 300 pages a day, you'll read a book a month. That's about how long each book goes. I'm like, that doesn't carry the to make any sense and i hadn't read yeah i, I had fallen off like everybody was trapped <laughs> in social media and i was like I, i'm gonna try that out and i read like four books in two months i was like this is amazing <laughs> and so i was like all right well what how can i actualize this i'm gonna read 10 pages a day i'm gonna do a review on the podcast and i made the mistake of doing a verbal commitment y'all have probably done this before and the audience started holding me accountable so about 10 books in i was like this is the most miserable exercise i've ever been through <laughs> I'm going to push forward uh, through, for the audience. So, yes, it was the books, uh, but also it's the guests just living through and interviewing guests and hearing their lived experiences. And like I said, with FinCon now, 2016, what is that, eight years ago almost? Um seeing where they are now and where they started. Like I've talked to people and I've interviewed them again and now they're millionaires or multimillionaires or they own their own businesses. Uh, one woman is, she's like, doing some like reality show now that we had on. And at that time she had paid off like 20,000 or something. So it's, it's, I find the story of lived experiences fascinating. And then I try to have takeaways and nuggets uh, from that. So yes, it was the books. If that's your learning style. And it is for me, cause I am an auditor at the end of the day, but the inspiration came from others lived experience. Cause that's not, that's not my reality. I'm like, Oh, and you know, it's kind of the representation matters. So I see a man or woman who looks like me, who's achieving it or doing it with more or less. And I'm like, there's no excuse for me not to now. How do I emulate that in my life? Great. Yeah. Craig, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think that's great. I think, um, you know, um, I really don't have anything to add. <laughs> uh, okay. Great. All right, Marcus. So your story is a, Pretty interesting one, right? Started off with a whole lot of debt in your 20s, uh, got scrappy in your late 20s, early 30s, chasing money, but also saving a whole bunch of money. So now we're in a good financial position. You've got a good job, making good money, investing in the stock market. And your next step now is to really pursue, you know, maybe you're like lean fire or pretty close to lean fire right now, but now you're getting to that next step of a fat fire, which you want to do through real estate. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it's for me moving the finish line up and having more control over my income and, and, and really my life. Right. And just, and, just, and just, I love what you said about just like taking back that time to like live the day that you want to live. And so there's been lots of wisdom that you've given us in this episode, but any last words of wisdom before we head into our final four? Um, I don't think I've shared it here. Um, I've been watching these motivational videos recently uh, on a playlist. I'm, I'm that guy now. Um, and one that I heard from Steve Harvey was the road to self-improvement is always under construction. And I think that's kind of why I'm always going through these changes. You think you're going to reach a finish line. You get to the top of a mountain. You realize how many more mountains there are to climb. So my next finish line will be real estate, but I'm sure there'll be another finish line after that. For sure. Just make sure you stop and enjoy the view at the uh, at the top of each mountain. I have a question. So I want to know what you're visualizing for your real estate future. Do you have a plan or a strategy that you're like, I want to try this one out? Um, 
for me, uh, it'll be with getting with a financial planner and a real estate. So I like to surround myself with a team, find an expert and follow their advice. Uh, and I have two financial planners that I, I have in mind. Uh, and another thing, my fiance literally texted me yesterday. She's like, I want to I need help putting a budget together. I've been lecturing her about this for five years. That, that being said, I'm glad it's coming to fruition. <laughs> uh, and so now it's joining the vision of two people. And that's kind of what's making me think about this. What it looks like in actuality, I just, I know in my head what I want to accomplish and I need to figure out what that looks like in a system. I want cash flowing properties uh, that replace my income, whether that's fully through real estate. So my take home after tax, I think is like 7,000 or something like that. And that's before the side hustles on the, on the personal business. What I would like is to have multiple income streams, real estate or otherwise, that replace that. Because I know that I'm happy there. I can live on that. It's a lifestyle that I'm accustomed to. We take vacations, everything like that. And I wouldn't have to ask permission for PTO so I could control my life. So I know that threshold could be happiness and then building up from there. So what I don't know is what are the funnels to fill that income? One thing I want to highlight is that you might actually need less than that because at the current place, you're saving a portion of that. It might be 50% of that, right? So um, if you're going to just actually replace that with uh, real estate income that will just continually come, maybe you only need four or 5000 And the math with real estate is really fun because you could find properties where they make you $1,000 a month and then you only need five of them, right? So um, it is really fun that way. It looks like Craig has something to say. I just love real estate. Um, I, I know, think me too. <laughs> yeah, I just think like it takes that financial independence track of that, you know, a lot of a lot of people in the financial independence community like the index funds, but it takes 10, 15 years, right? Like, I think it's pretty typical to that's just to hit like a million. And so, you know, 4% rule, that's $40,000 a year. You ain't living a uh, that good of a lifestyle on forty thousand dollars a year. Personally, I wouldn't, at least, uh, especially with inflation and gas prices these days. You'll pay forty thousand a year on gas. So, um, you know, I think like being able to have an asset like real estate that grows with inflation, that provides passive income, that gives you the tax benefits, that has the loan pay down, and I'll, I'll go on forever, right? Um, it, it's just such a powerful way to invest. I don't think it's coincidence that 90% of America's millionaires hold real estate. So love it. We're excited for you to be on your journey. Yeah. I mean, so am I, 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 I don't emulate a lot cause like I said, I'm an auditor, uh, but I, I'm, I'm also, it's new. So that's another pivot I'm at in my life. I don't plan on stopping the index fund. I definitely don't plan on stopping the multiple income streams. Uh, so I, I plan to, I kind of see those as maybe concurrent races that are also running. A lot of them are automated though. And so I'm like, well, so what's also going to challenge uh, me in these next decades of my life that I could be excited about? Yeah. yeah love it. Learning a whole new skill. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's get into the final Final four. four. The final four. Question number one. <laughs> yes, 100% of this. <laughs> uh, question number one, what are you reading right now? I think I know. <laughs> yeah, you already know the one that I read. I'm surprised I don't have the title memorized. Uh, so it's Bigger Pockets, I think, How to Invest in Real Estate or something to that effect. I know yep. for a fact it's a Bigger Pockets book. But I'll, I'll just say another book because I'm reading two concurrently. I'm reading The Ends of the World by Peter Brennan, which sounds much darker than it is. And also, I'm a full-fledged nerd. So it's about like the seven, I think. It might be four major extinction events, obviously including the dinosaurs. But like there's seven other major extinctions that almost ended the world. All right. Interesting. All right. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? I'll, I'll just go with my father's quote because uh, at least it's at the front of my mind. So he told me, and he does this, he's still around. <laughs> uh, he used to tell me things too early in life for me to appreciate or understand. I think I was like seven. And he was like, son, I want you to use your 20s to learn, your 30s to apply, and your 40s to teach and mentor. I get the voice from my father. And I, I was like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, when I got about 20, 30, 40, when I hit those milestones, it started to make sense. So I, and I, I've used those in job interviews. I've repeated it a thousand times. It, it impresses people as the first time they heard it. <laughs> he might have stolen it from somewhere. Hopefully he didn't get sued in, eventually. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I love that insight. And I, I think I've done a good job of applying those time mm, Perfect. I like it. I love it. Um, question number three, what is your why? 
it's evolving. Um, so for me, it's going to be family legacy. I think the simplest would be legacy. Uh, I know one of the times in which my mindset changed, we were actually about to record a podcast. It was Sunday and we record on Sundays, release on Mondays. And we got the news that a helicopter had gone down in the hills. Y'all might know where this story is going. And then we found out that it was Kobe. We took a break. I took an hour, took a walk around the neighborhood. And then we found out that his daughter had also passed and 12 other individuals. I believe the count was, it's like, we're not recording a podcast today. And this was pre pandemic. And I was just like, it, it fundamentally changed what I wanted to be doing with my life. Like I, my, I, I just, you know, how there's, there's those events in your life. I was like, my life will be different from here. And it, it started the, another inception event on, you know, Kobe was, I think in his forties, uh, if not younger than 42, but he was near enough in age for me to change how I approach my own life. So I think it would be legacy. Mm. Love that. Yeah. He was 41 when he passed. Uh, so um, I was like 38, 37. Yeah. It hit me a lot harder sure. than I thought it would for a celebrity death. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I think that was a, that was a, a uh, that was like the, the tip. That was like the thing that kicked off 2020. That was just like, yeah. this year is going to suck. And then yeah, like, we all know where you were. It's one of those, you know where you were. A hundred percent. I know exactly where I was when I found out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all right. On a less serious note, who was your first ever crush? Uh, it was T Tony, I think her name was. And Jason, if I ever see him, is going to be furniture moving. So Tony was elementary school. I had a crush on a curly haired girl named Tony and I could best to my best friend, Jason. Uh, but I wasn't at a point where I could talk to women at that time because I'm in elementary school. And he's like, hey, don't, hey, there's Tony. Don't you have a crush on her? Uh, turned around and we made eye contact. I think Tony had a crush on me, too. And I was like, hell no. I let women. <laughs> Girls, <laughs> goonies. <laughs> 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 I think she, you know, ran off crying. Her curly hair was bopping in the background. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, damn it, so, I missed my chance. <laughs> and Jason just moved on. He's like, eh, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's a uh, yeah. That that was that was the first. It sticks with me. Awesome, I love that man. All right, where can people find out more about you, your podcast, your book, everything else? Uh, so you can find the Marcus Garrett Show wherever you're listening to this podcast, where every week we have entertaining conversation with your favorite influencers about life after debt. Uh, some of the free giveaways that I was talking about earlier, you can visit themarcusgarrett.com. I've got all kinds of giveaways there, including a 30-day free trial for office hours. So you can go to themarcusgarrett.com, join the newsletter if you doubt the office hours, like who is this guy, or click the office hours button to get started. Cool. Awesome. So go check out the marcusgarrett.com for more info there. Marcus, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's been definitely an, an awesome time chatting with you and getting to know your story a little bit more. Uh, Z, anything you want to add? No, I'm just really excited. I really enjoyed being on Marcus's show. So go and check that out too. But um, just good conversation. And I, I appreciate your depth and vulnerability. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. all Thanks for having me. All right. See you, man. And that was the Marcus Garrett. Z, what'd you think of Marcus? I feel like Marcus had some really good nuggets of wisdom. I love how he breaks certain concepts down, like his debt pay down. Um, and so it sounds like his book would probably be really entertaining. I think I'm going to go check it out. Um, just learning strategies, but also hearing his stories. And yeah, I just appreciate his depth and his vulnerability. And I liked that he talked about mental health because I think that's a taboo topic, just like money. Yeah, I think it is too. And, and I tend to really get attracted to taboo topics. Like if a taboo topic comes up, I want to dig in deeper. And I think mental health is something that I think we all kind of go through it. Um, I know, like, again, I didn't even realize that I was depressed when I maybe was. And I don't like to call myself depressed or say I'm clinically depressed because at the end of the day, like that word to me just feels like it's going to bring me down. So I never admit that to anybody. But like looking back at my time in California, I was like, damn, like I was happy and smiling and all that. But I think on the inside, I was not. So I think it's just interesting kind of how that reflection happens when you feel true happiness. Yeah. And I think it happens to lots of people. So yeah, if you're feeling sad, Find yourself a therapist, a buddy, so you can talk to. Yeah. 
And honestly, even if you're not, like I've got tons of friends and I may do this too, where they just have a therapist, even though if they're not sad and they're not depressed, just someone to like talk to about the deep stuff, you know, talk to, get stuff off your chest and just have someone be there to listen. That's kind of like an unbiased opinion. So, um, yeah, something that I've been thinking about for a while. I've never actually taken action towards it, but. Well, we all know you need it, Craig. So I'm glad yeah. you're coming around to it. <laughs> all right. yeah. Fair enough, Z. Fair enough. Um, anything else you want to say before we pop off here? Not really. I'm just excited. And I would love to ask everybody to leave us a rating or review. If you like our show, share it around with your friends. And we'll see you next week. Yeah, yeah we'll see you next week. Bye. That's it for this episode of Investify. We hope that these nuggets of real estate wisdom lead to more savvy financial planning and a clearer path towards financial freedom. For more content like this, subscribe to the show at investify.com. Don't forget to leave a rating and share it with your friends. Together, we can transform more real estate newbies into successful and clever investors. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next one.